Welcome to Star Wars Samurai Universe. Uh, first of all, it's like going home week. Nathan Seekerman and I had our very first panel in this room, what, eight or nine years ago? It was just like yesterday. It was just like yesterday. I've got a little um, quiz up front. If Please raise your hands and hold them up if you've seen any Star Wars movie. <laughs> Keep them held up if you watch The Mandalorian. If you've seen episodes of Visions. If you have a fantasy that you would like to either appear in a Star Wars property or write or direct for one. Okay, you can put your, down your hands. Now, all of you people are the people we've made this panel for. Because I want you to think about this. Many people think that Star Wars started 46 years ago. The inspiration for Star Wars started four to six hundred years ago. So what we're going to do is give you a sense of what it's like to be a part of that samurai universe that is alive today in every single Star Wars property. So let's start out with an introduction of our panelists. Well, hey everyone. My name is Brendan Prout. I am a nerd of many colors, been deeply involved in the Comic-Con scene for 36 years or so. I'm one of the co-founders of the San Diego Star Wars Society, which is a non-profit uh, fan club, not specifically a costume club. We embrace every aspect of the fandom, but we have the distinction of being kind of the mothership from which all of the other Star Wars clubs in our area spawned from. And we are the only all-ages, family-friendly club that there is. Most of the other clubs involve needing to be at least 18 years old and having screen-accurate costumes, such things like that. We, we embrace everyone from the younglings and foundlings on up. Um, I'm also an author. I'm one of the contributing authors of Superhero Grief, The Transformative Power of Loss, which is a book published in 2020 that explores how we use superhero stories and pop culture media like Star Wars to delve into matters of grief and loss and moving through those journeys. So that um, I'm a mental health professional, I'm a counselor for the Navy, I'm also a pastor, I, and I have ADHD, that is my superpower. So very involved in cosplay and um, a lot of charitable work around San Diego and very happy to be here. Oh, oh, and yeah, um, I was a martial artist for many years. I, I practiced kendo, among other arts, taekwondo, bangsul, sambo, and jujitsu. So I bring a little bit of my training and experience to that, uh, to the arena here. Would you like to introduce our mystery guest? Our, our mystery guest, uh, we've flipped roles. This is my daughter. Uh, she goes by Littlest Jedi online, which is really funny because she hasn't worn a Jedi outfit in many years. But she is normally cosplaying, and I'm usually her handler at such events. But we have flip-flopped today because uh, David down there, who will introduce himself, was nice enough to let me slip into his Boba Fett samurai outfit for the day. And she's been making sure stuff doesn't fall off me. and taking pictures and do all, all the wonderful things that handlers do, but she has a tremendous amount of cosplay. She's been cosplaying since she was a little kid, and uh, yeah, lots of, lots of stuff out there. Um, so yeah, I'm David Hernandez. I'm a member of the 501st Legion, the Star Wars Samurai Universe, the Legacy Cosplay, the San Diego you know, Star Wars Society, where there are so many things you can do. It's fantastic. A lot of different points uh, for, for each of those each of those groups. I have, uh, I'm an associate producer for Star Trek Axanar and Star Trek Yorktown, A Time to Heal. I work as a computer geek during the day. I'm the second oldest guy here. I'm the second- By quite a margin. Second oldest guy here. So yeah, I'll be almost, I'll be 60 this year. So you know, this is for everybody. And there are reasons that we do this and the reasons are not fame and fortune because typically our faces are covered. So we'll we'll go over that later. You know, there are there are reasons that we do this. We'll cover that, and 
I'll tell you, it's, it's fantastic to build your own stuff and get out and people say, wow, this looks so great, I've never seen anything like it. So we're, we'll talk about that too. But uh, that's just a little about me. Go on to the next. Hi, buddy. I'm Nathan Siegerman, and my background is uh, start with USC Film School. I got out of film school and worked in digital effects early on and transitioned from uh, the computer effects to programming. And that's really what became my military career. But um, as I entered the world of conventions, uh, I brought that engineering, and there was uh, there was this request from my boys, and they said, "Would you, for a charity event, make a life-size samurai captain phasma?" So this was actually built to fit me, but along the road, uh, what I found that you can do with the cosplays that you build is then bring them to charity events. And that's kind of the, the hidden double reward in getting into this. So we met, and I'm a member of you know, numerous groups, just like David. And um, I'm wearing this recent build, which is a mashup of Commander Bly decided to leave uh, the uh, clone army after Order 66 and jumped into Amanda. And what really helps with this whole thing in, in the background is how it shows the code and how the armor evolves from samurai background and into this. And we'll talk about that more as we get into it. But I want you to also be introduced to the wonderful. Hi, I'm Leah Panos, and I'm a military wife, a homeschool mom, I'm a charity cosplayer with all these guys right here, and I love Star Wars. And I get to be the, the token tall female to model this beautiful armor that Nathan built. And if you're familiar from episode seven and eight with uh, Captain Phasma's character, uh, they really did her dirty, and if you read her backstory, she's amazing. So it's an honor for me to wear this awesome armor today. So to let you know, back in, uh, when George Lucas was going to USC Film School, John Melios decided that he needed uh, a little bit of different background training, so he took him to two movies. Hidden Fortress and Seven Samurai. And this pretty much changed George's full attitude towards the movie. For Seven Samurai, have, how many people have seen this movie? Okay, you remember the leader of the bandits was a guy that had an eye patch? That was Dante Masamune. That's based on a real samurai. He was known as the One Eyed Dragon. And that character is what the Darth Vader outfit is based on. And so that's why I wear Date Masamune's crest. You know, usually I have, you saw the WonderCon crest before. The other really intriguing thing was Hidden Fortress. George had this epiphany. What if I told a movie through the two most minor characters in the movie? So that the two lowest samurais that were in the battle, you know, the short, stubby one, the tall, skinny one, became R2D2 and 3PL. And how many of you been to an Anthony Daniels panel? He points out the first 19 minutes of all of Star Wars is all about Dan Anthony Daniels because he's got all the dialogue. And thereafter, he's in all of the movies. Now, to give you an idea, when we come forward and to Mandalorian, the Mandalorian is based on two main samurai movie themes, Lone Wolf and Cub, which is a fantastic series. If you have the chance, there's about 16 episodes, and there's also a graphic novel series. And then Yojimbo. Now, when Seven Samurai became the Magnificent Seven, Yojimbo became 
fistful of dollars and a few dollars more. That's your Jimbo. Now, to give you an idea of how, when I said to you earlier, do you want to be a director? All the directors for The Mandalorian are required to see the samurai movies. Now, remember the Van, uh, Mandalorian village scene? You know, where the only time he takes off his helmet, where Bryce Howard, she directed that scene? Do you know that that is the whole episode is a retake of the Seven Samurai. That's what that episode's about. When you see Visions, the duel at the opening of Visions, that's Yojimbo. And this is going to continue throughout the properties as we move forward. And so what I would like you to really encourage you after we're done with the panel, start looking at the samurai culture and the samurai movies and you'll realize that this is you will enrich in your experience when you watch episodes you know almost everything that's out there right now that's affiliated with star wars i can i can set you down and i can you know do a 10-hour panel on oh, this is this this is this this is it and and right now i'm working on a book called the book of star wars samurai and that will encompass all of this stuff. Now what I'd like to point out, we all know that the lightsaber has got to be the most iconic part of all Star Wars. Now I would like you to imagine this. Toshiro Mofuni, who played Yojimbo, and also the sort of crazy samurai and seven samurai he was offered Obi-Wan Kenobi. And his agent said, nah, it's just going to be a silly kid's movie. And they offered him Darth Vader. Can you imagine our American culture today if Toshiro Mufuni had been Obi-Wan Kenobi? Because Obi-Wan Kenobi does not sound like a British actor's name. Okay? Now, so I would like to have Brandon and David talk a little about the history and the connection between Kendo and the lightsaber. Well, Nathan and Lee, they're going to get ready and they're going to give you some tips on the costuming. You want to lead it? Yeah, gotcha. All right. So I, I also practice I practiced Kung Fu for a long time, in, in decades ago. But then later, I decided I wanted to study Japanese sword. So I actually practice Iaido, the, the art of drawing the sword. Uh, I'm a first degree black belt in that. So it's, it's just wonderful. You know, there's, there's a discipline to it that you have to get into. You really have to become one with the sword because you start off with swords that are made of aluminum or tin or zinc, you know, some kind of alloy, and they're not sharp. But as you progress and you get better at it, the teacher will come to you and say, hey, you know, I think it's time you start using a real sword. So now I'm working with a real sword. And when you've got three feet of razor blade in front of you and you're swinging it around and you're not looking when you're putting it away, you gotta be careful. There's a lot of discipline to, to the art. And lightsabers are very similar, right? If you look at the, the theory behind the lightsaber, you've got this, this plasma beam of, of energy coming out, and it can basically cut through anything except this car. And, <laughs> and you're going you're gonna to cut yourself to bits if you aren't careful or if you do something wrong. So discipline is, is super important in this, and there's a focus and a beauty to it that it goes beyond it being a weapon. It, it becomes the honing mechanism for your mind and your body to work together. Uh, one of the things that I gravitated towards when I first started martial arts, I didn't know that I was going to be trained in multiple martial arts. I went to a Taekwondo studio and while we were there, the teacher decided we needed to cross train in some other things. So it started with Jiu Jitsu learning how to grapple, and then that moved into Sambo, which is Russian wrestling, which was a lot of fun. And then we 
we started learning weapons, and it started off through the art of Bong Sul, learning how to use sticks and various staffs. And of course, we all wanted to play with swords because we'd grown up with Star Wars and uh, using Shanae and Bakken. That was the closest we could come to actually being Jedi when we were younger. So uh, training in the art, we, we did not train in the art of drawing. It was <laughs> the art of not getting a concussion. Uh, but the form of uh, area of Bushido and the discipline of learning is essentially a dance. It's a dance with weapons. And others who have trained far longer than I can speak to it more articulately, but there's a beauty to the martial art, the art part of the martial art. And that is something that we definitely see brought into the Star Wars universe. Um, if you've ever had an opportunity to watch some of the background extra features from the original trilogy, seeing how the choreographers brought in both the Errol Flynn swashbuckling, let's swing the, the laser swords around uh, flamboyantly kind of thing with the actual real world sword play of Kendu in, in bringing in the Bushido code of honor, which I've, I've got the tenants up there. You can see how these are all reflected in the Jedi. This is deeply street steeped in the tradition that we have within the, the Star Wars universe of these essentially samurai knights of the, the Old Republic. What I'd like to do also, uh, how many people realize, you know, before every Olympic Games is allowed to have a demonstration sport. And it's given, if, you, if the public approves of it, four years later it becomes a a competition sport. The French have decided lightsaber dueling is their demonstration sport. I now so if, officially like the French. Yes. So if you go online, go to YouTube, go to Olympic lightsaber, they're already doing the promos, the transitions, and if you go to the, 20, uh, the 2024 Olympics, take your lightsaber. You're going to be surprised. They are embracing this sport like you can't imagine. It's as though it's 1977 all over again and somebody says, well, geez, maybe for the 1980 games we should have this. So now I would like to have, go ahead. Except if you're gonna use lightsabers in the Olympics, there's only a gold medal because there can only be one, right? Whoa. <laughs> So, Nathan, would you like to uh, talk a little about the, the beauty of this armor is how much different it is from 501st as far as your comfort design and, and skill set in designing your own outfit. So, this Samurai Captain Phasma armor based on the toy by Bandai, it is intended to be worn by a person life size. So that meant it had to have all the necessary functionality. And what I want to just try to point out is demonstrating some of the compression that you see on the pieces. So this has actually been put together with 3D printed because I'm now pursuing the direction of programming and doing modeling. And so instead of like David, who's got leather, these are 3D printed parts, and then also a little bit of foam here or there. Uh, and the paracord is what I use to bring it together. And so you see this compression, and you see the range of motion. You do that because like, this is really important, right? So somebody that has to you know, draw a lightsaber or a sword, yes. And she can do her holds, and if she were to, say, be riding a horse or motorcycle, Right? So I'm going to do a turn. So it actually does split. So there's there's a seated area. And so you've got your outer armor and you've got your secondary skirt armor. And so these are typically um, going to be harder and these would be like a hardened leather. But in this case, I wanted to do foam and I was able to integrate Yaya Han's foam material that was at Joanne's for a little while. So it's really great that 
we can integrate some old things as well as have all the new things. So the old things would be using a, a buckle that's actually gravity driven to hold these on. So that's why they would always need help to put this on. She's gotten so good that, I mean, all I had to help with really this time was the knot, the, the, the belt, which is a jujitsu blue, a uh, purple belt. And purple is what they use on the toy, so it just doesn't have any other significance than that. And so um, then the 3D printed, so it's trying to be 3D printed as much as possible. And this is not something that's out there, like these pieces are essentially an evolution of when we as designers observed what was traditional and I had to draw this from scratch, then you know we saw this armor in the Mandalorian. So this is actually Death Watch. Okay. Um, what I'm hoping that you're seeing is, look, I've got a comma and I can sit in. And she's essentially, you know, has her comma, which is the underskirt. And we build up from there. So that's kind of like, you know, what's really amazing about the evolution of the culture being integrated into Star Wars. And normally I would be wearing, I'm a member of the 501st myself, I'd be wearing my Stormtrooper armor to compare how impossible it is to move around. And in comparison to this, I have a very difficult time sitting down in that armor. I have modified it so that I can, but I will just say I'm really comfy right now sitting in this. Yeah. So. back of the, under the armor, is it EVA foam? This is EVA foam, and I stitched paracord right through it. It is EVA foam, and he stitched paracord right through it. There we go. Wow. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah. Um, there, will you just do a quick stride? So, work it. <laughs> So one of the things we talk about is, you know, the flaring the knees, and she had to adopt, learn how to do her uh, cowboy walk. Because that's just the way it is with the way it's designed to be seated. But the functionality is, you know, the history that brings you forward to what I'm wearing today as a person. Yeah. Awesome. It really helps to have that kind of knee protection when you're battling Ewoks. <laughs> uh, yes. Any other questions? I think we're yeah, while we're going through this, by the way, if you have, this is intended to be an interactive panel, so if you've got questions, you can kind of come up here. We do have a microphone in the front so that others can hear your questions. Every time somebody says, I'm loud enough, you never are. So. Yeah, so if you have any questions, why don't you start lining up behind the microphone. I'd like to have David talk about, he's, he has really started to embrace the, the armor, and so the two outfits here on set, other than me, are his. So can you talk a little about your, uh, the transition that you've experienced? Yeah, so as a, as a member of the 501st Legion, I'm a Darth Vader there. And Darth Vader, that's a hot heavy leather, plastics, resins, gloves, five layers. It's very heavy, it's very hot. You have to have fans running in the helmet. Everything fogs up. It doesn't matter how cold it is outside, you are at 90 degrees or, or hotter. And if it's a troop in July and you're out doing something, it's hard. It's very, very hard to do. Yeah, see, th this armor, the, the armor I'm wearing here, this is this is leather, leather strips, right? Leather strips, and you can use power, power because I can't hear me. Right? So here we've got leather. Yeah, thank you. There we go. So this is this is leather. It's all leather. It's all leather. And then in the back, I attached a cape. And of course, I couldn't get dressed alone. So thank you to my wife who strapped me into this and said, ha ha, you're done, good luck. <laughs> but, uh, the difference is remarkable in mobility and how cool, how cool it is. And really, look at me. 
Am I Kylo Ren right now? No, right? This is a samurai. But as soon as I add the helmet and the, the little upside down rebel, because he's not quite right in the head, right? Um, so my rebel insignia is upside down on purpose. But when you add, add the helmet to it, now you've got Kylo Ren. So what, what do you like? There's a difference in price when, when you're looking at building stuff. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? I built the, the Boba armor because I was on a budget, crazy budget. It's EVA foam that I cut with a paper pattern and followed what they had on screen to the best of my ability, and I, I bought some decals. So is it 501st or Merc approvable with those groups? No, because they are at screen accuracy level. All right. This was armor I could wear that looked cool, that let me do samurai on it, and then picked up the leather armor so that I could do something different. But you know, you can still put parts of yourself into the armor. I know I, I've mentioned this at, at a previous panel. I mentioned on his right shoulder, on my two shoulders, you see there's a little patch inside there. That's, I'm Puerto Rican, that's actually my family crest. So this is my armor, I made it mine, you know? Make it yours. And what, what are you going to do? What are you gonna do with this stuff? That armor, I, I think you could build that armor for, let's see, 100. You could probably build the whole set for 100 bucks and then add a helmet, right? So I got, I got the, uh, it, it's a bulletproof vest cover on the inside. That's what I used because I didn't have access to the more expensive stuff because I was on a budget. So I got that for like 30 bucks on eBay and then the phone's like 30 bucks on eBay. And yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, that, what do you want to do with it? If, if you want to get into, whoops, yeah, that's right. If you want to get into having your own set of armor, think about what it is you want to do, why you want to do it. We go out and we work charity events, and those charity events are, they're wonderful. You know, we go and our faces are covered and nobody knows who we are, but we visit sick kids in the hospital and, and brighten their day up. You know, that's happened, walk in, and I, I told this story last time. Remember the, uh, I went into a hospital as Darth Vader. I went to visit a particular kid who was in for some I injuries. And I walk by uh, the room of, a, of another child, and he just lit up. And later, the nurse brought him by to the room I was in. Hey, he just wanted to meet you. He hasn't been out of bed all day. He's been depressed. He's got brain cancer. And, you know, it really gets you. The kid hadn't been up all day until he saw Darth Vader. And then he got up because he wanted to see Darth Vader. And then he was able to do his rounds for his exercise for the day. So you don't know what kind of effect you're gonna have on the people that are around you, and they don't know who you are. So I find a reason. Maybe it's you wanna just have fun, but maybe you wanna come join us and, and visit people and brighten their day. And you can do it on a budget. It's not something you have to spend thousands of dollars on. You can do this on a budget. So I highly encourage, uh, if, if, it's, if it's something you have any interest in, it's super cool to walk around and feel like a samurai, but also be Star Wars, okay? Yeah, and, and you to, can definitely run away and join the circus and find us. We've got a, a Star Wars, San Diego, sorry, yeah. Star Wars Samurai Universe group on Facebook. It's where we connect and help one another find the resources uh, especially on the cheap and and get connected with the events that we can show up and have fun in this universe doing these things. And I want to let you see, if you watch the samurai movies, especially Ron, you know, anything that Kurosawa did, you know, they're not always in armor. Sometimes they're at their temple or at the uh, family you know, lodge. And so you can also do samurai attire that's comfortable. I love this guy's kimono. Do not get near me, or you, you might be leaving without that. I'll, 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 I'll challenge you to a duel right now. That's a great looking kimono. So the thing is, is that remember that all the Jedi 
They're basically in samurai's relaxed kimono gear. That's it. And so transitioning from Star Wars gear to samurai's gear, all you're doing is stepping back 600 years. And wouldn't you love to say that your costume's 600 years old, not just six days old? But if you do want something six days old, um, while we're talking, I've had these slides going, there is a, a group online that is constantly generating new Star Wars samurai crossover art. A lot of it's using the AI programs that are out there, and you can feed in prompts and come up with a lot of these really creative things, you know, R2-D2, if he were in the samurai universe, whatever. Um, so. Definitely, if you are looking for inspiration and you want something to be your own and a little different, there's a lot of creative ways to achieve that. And, and there are artists as well who are down on Artists Alley on the floor. I'm gonna throw out my little advertisement there because as a long time volunteer with Comic Con, 15 years with programming, thank you, programming department, and uh, now five years with Artists Alley, we've got a lot of artists that are doing crossover art down on the floor, bringing the samurai universe into not just Star Wars, but many other uh, interesting, fun franchises, but mostly Star Wars. Yeah, it's not just Star Wars. If you go online, go to Bandai Toys, you will see that they basically crossed over everything. Marvel, DC, Star Wars, the whole bit. And the, the quality of details, you know, you just buy one action figure, set that in, you know, in your studio to stare at, and it's a great way to you know, keep inspired as to what's occurring. Do we have any general questions? Anybody curious as to how something came about, where it came, there we go. How much do our armors weigh approximately? Okay, well, most of you who know how I started, it was all kids' toys just glued on to me. It got up to be 55 pounds. At the time, I was 220. And thanks to Nathan saying, you know, you're just going to burn out in a hurry. So uh, I, I discovered 3D printing and also uh, a lot of different foam materials. At one to at when the outfit was um, 55 pounds, the helmet alone was 19 pounds. That's why it rested on my shoulders, not my head. This whole outfit that you see today is nine pounds. So you really can uh, do some amazing stuff. And, I, and as you've heard quite a bit, the problem with sort of duplicating everything that's on street, that you see in the movies, that's all heavy stuff. The beauty of doing mashup is you can make it as light as you want and very comfortable. It's a lot easier. We were just discussing before the panel um, some of the less comfortable official 501st approved costumes are to wear, such as the First Order Stormtrooper armor, where you, if you're wearing it, you can't feed yourself. You can't get your arms in position to get food into your mouth. Uh, Vader, you can't lift your, your arms above about here. My uh, original trilogy Stormtrooper armor, there's a lot of mobility issues with that. They're very uncomfortable, and pretty much any time you saw them on screen doing something other than standing there, it's a very short take because I guarantee you there were parts falling off or getting misaligned three seconds after you saw that shot, and that's a reality of many of these costumes. Whereas the, the samurai-based costumes were designed for real-world daily use, and they're far more comfortable, they're far more lightweight, they're far more forgiving. I'm not worried about going home and finding bruises all over my body, and sometimes cuts on my body from wearing stormtrooper armor or other costumes, which is a reality in the 501st. You also don't worry about using the restroom. Yeah, well, and some of the, we mentioned how she walked, and that, that walk is a, uh, a little bit of a preventative of chafing, but this is the heaviest armor up here because it's 3D print and it's full shin, full arm, and I think you're, I think you were at like 25 pounds somewhere around there. And that was another motivator for me to not like make one for myself. 
and show comparatively evolution because these are super light. They, you, I'm back down to 12 pounds, and but it's and it's all plastic, but the mobility is is much much better. And just like Brenda was mentioning, mobility is key for you know get your phone out, get your keys out, you know, uh, get some food, get some water, and you know those things are what make a difference in your con experience. So. You know, it's it's definitely every time you build something and you wear it, it is a test. And it doesn't matter how many times you've worn it, you're gonna find something new that you should tweak because you want the wear to be better each time. Yes? The helmet, is it open on the back? The helmet, is it open on the back? So the helmet is split in the samurai tradition, so the flaps intentionally open up, so you're moving your head this way, that way, and it also compresses, so that if you're moving and it gives you that mobility. Um, this one in particular, what I did is, it's a combination of the actual toy front, that's the toy front, and then this is a 3D print, and the 3D printed pieces and the laurel leaf are screwed into it, but the whole thing for comfort has been built on top of a SWAT helmet. Right, so it's got a head basket in there, it's got a chin strap, and that way um, we could easily add neck guard. Lee, could you talk about what it feels like to play one of the most iconic female characters in all of Star Wars that we know so little about? Yeah, um, it's it's really a great experience wearing this because you get a really different reaction compared to, I do a lot of face characters like Rey or Princess Leia, and people, oh, that's nice, you know, and then they see this and they're just like, whoa, that is, that is so cool. So it's um, it, a really wild experience though, also not smiling for pictures when people <laughs> are, you know, I'm looking at you. Or people, sometimes they, they're even kind of rough and they want to, I, I don't know, it's, it's very different than the, the um, the way that people treat you with this kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, Port Phasma, like she, her backstory is fascinating. And, um, yeah, uh, it... The public service announcement is, it's not real armor, it's plastic. So, a lot of people do approach it like, wow, it looks like it's metal, and want to do a big old punch, and it will break. You know, it's, it's plastic, it's not real armor. So you do have to remind fans when they get a little bit too excited. Like, this is to portray the storytelling imagination of this character's persona. And I am so thankful that the Mandalorian has pushed this helmet on all the time. Because I'll tell you, that, to me, that's the power of doing cosplay, whether you're doing Star Wars or Samurai. The helmet is the power. There's an amazing sensation when the, you know that the world's not looking at your face, but you get to check everything else out yourself. It's, it's, it's really a potent energy. And when you do your own mashup design, that gives you even more control on the way you feel about yourself in the world. I'm gonna mention something. My, my good friend Ed over here, he, he put together a Mandalorian outfit, all right? So we're saying you can build stuff light, you can build stuff a little heavier, you can build stuff, you know, eight pounds, nine pounds. Ed's got real armor. It's steel, Mandalorian steel. So he's got steel and heavy leather and steel gauntlets. You know, you can, you can do whatever you want. And that, that armor is amazing. It's absolutely amazing, but it's, it's real armor. So you can only wear it for yeah, about you can two hours. Wear it for two hours. But if somebody wants to punch that, you know, well, <laughs> good luck. That's that's going to hurt. But uh, you have you have the choice. You know, what can your body handle? What can you handle? You want to come up to the microphone here? Everybody wants to see you anyway. Yeah, he's got. Thank a, you. He's got a thumbs up. He's good. So I got a question about kind of like uh, kendo, um, and then so I asked, I have to ask um, when it comes to lightsaber training. 
because uh, you also mentioned lightsaber dueling, uh, such as like, you know, I said Paris, uh, France. Um, so where do you guys look at your kendo style versus your lightsaber styles? Like the well, one of the things really to keep in mind, I'm a, I'm a Western fencing uh, Olympic champion okay. in Epe. Uh, and the thing is, is that in Western fencing, it's all about speed, quick touches, everything. In kendo, you actually have to announce where you're going to hit before you hit that location or it doesn't count. And they're going to incorporate that in the lightsaber battling so that you have to call out. Because if you were wielding a lightsaber, you don't get hit twice. <laughs> There's, there's something to be said that it is a very close parallel between kendo uh, and lightsaber dueling. In what I would consider swashbuckling sword play that we often see on screen, it's very fancy. There's twirling, there's movements, there's a lot of footwork. In kendo, the, the idea is one cut, one kill. It's efficiency of motion, it's conservation of motion, and if you make the wrong move, you may be dead. So uh, it's a very different translation, and with lightsabers, yeah, these things are super dangerous. So when I was watching the original, the first duel that I saw with Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader on the Death Star in 1977, and they're very slowly approaching one another in the hallway. That is exactly what it looks like when I see kendo masters approaching each other for a duel. They are not rushing in. They are measuring one another. But it, it could take the full two minute of a round before they move in on each other for one move. And people complained about it wasn't fast enough, it wasn't this, but it was pretty true to the art now for the, the Phantom Menace. They mixed in a lot of different styles to give it the swashbuckling on screen, beauty of the dance, because there is the other aspect of kendo, and it's not just the combat art where it's one cut, one kill. It's the dance art where you, me you memorize different moves in a different rhythm, in different patterns, and there's a, a precision and a desire to achieve perfection in that. And those moves are, are elegant and gorgeous. And that is what we were wanting to see on screen, in quick motion, beautifully personified. So there's those sort of parallels between kendo and, and the lightsaber. Um, ironically, down in San Diego, a long time ago, we started this thing called the Saber Guild. And it was a bunch of us in the San Diego Star Wars Society that wanted to start doing lightsaber training. We wanted to learn how to do some actual kendo moves and look like we knew what we were doing as we were out in public. And the very first instance of us getting together, somebody got a concussion from um, a, a park saber. And that was kind of the end of that for our club because we didn't have the insurance to be able to deal with such things. So Saber Guild branched off and became its own thing. They got their own insurance, and now they're all over the place. I, I, I think there's over 3,000 members worldwide. And if you were wanting to learn some Saber arts, Saber Guild is definitely where I would point you in their direction. They, they teach a lot of great, beautiful moves that are steeped in both the on-screen Jedi stuff as well as real-world swordplay. Um. My other question, like, as uh, European, I think it's European martial arts. I can't hear you. The European martial arts, um, when they do the whole dress up as knights. Yes. Um, SCA. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm familiar with that. I'm familiar with that combat. Right. Uh, with the long swords. Um, yes, the Society for Creative Anachronism. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Um, and then, so my question was regarding, uh, so is it just mostly kendo when you deal with the, uh, the like the your your props, or are you guys using actually like the accurate Star Wars like fighting styles? That was the Olympic Games, they are really fully severely padded up because um, they're not counting light touches. You know, you, the, the, the weapons will, are actually electrified to where you, when you hit. For instance, uh, for anybody that knows Epe, it's only like 100 grams of pressure that sets off the tip. 
for the for the lightsaber dueling in France. It's got to be a hit that would actually severely cut into the skin of a human being. It's a brutal sport. But the thing is, is they're treating it as uh, almost ballet. Watch the videos. Okay, and I really encourage you also watch fan base lightsaber videos. They are so much better than a lot of the movies. I just, I just love sitting there and watching them over and over because those people make a, a lot of effort. One last question. I have, a, yeah. I have another question, sorry. Uh, for your samurai stuff, what um, what ages are you looking at your samurai? Uh, do you take back historically? Do you go to like the Tokugawa period? or do you um, the, the Most of the stuff I study is about 600 years old. There's a, a wonderful six-part Netflix series called The Age of Samurai. Yes. And it'll really give you an in-depth. Also, I think it's... Uh, Star Wars Insider issue 206 that basically covers every, over about uh, 10 or 15 pages. It talks about all that we're talking about. And if you happen to check out uh, 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 the issue November, uh, issue will be 2011. Then you'll be able to get a little more background as to who Dude Vader is. And uh, I think that is about our time for the panel today. So we want to definitely honor our programming department people and make sure we make our way out. Where can people find the rest of you? I know we're wrapping up the convention here, but we have a photo shoot today, do we not? At 4.30 in front of the fountain. You can find me at Dude Vader Hero on Instagram. I'm G-O-M-C-S-E. Good luck with that. It's go make cool stuff every day. It's a stupid name. I'm stuck with it. Go, go MCSE. Hi, I'm in the same boat. It's not Captain, it's Capt Secretman on Instagram, Facebook. I'm Harp Girl 82 as in I play the harp. Um, I'm really boring. I use my name, so you can find me at Brendan Prout. It's like Brenda plus N Prout on Instagram or Facebook or wherever. So, yeah. Um, anyway, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoy the last couple of hours of the con. Come see us at the photo shoot. And definitely you can connect with us out in the hallway afterwards if you want to talk to us about anything. Happy to have been here with you.